Uh, my name is Susana Almanza, and I'm the director of Poder. People organize in defense of Earth and her resources. And actually, I got involved in community issues uh, back when I was in high school. Uh, but more um, when it came to the issue of the tank farm, uh, Poder got formed in 1991. Uh, uh, Poder was established on May the 1st, 1991, and what we did is we worked together to uh, kind of redefine what environment was. The environment is where people live, work, play, and pray. And so our mission is to look at environmental issues as, as social, as economic and social justice issues, and to address these issues through education, advocacy, and action. Well, our, really our goals have not really uh, changed. When we, when we started for that, it was actually looking at uh, what kind of polluting facilities were in our communities and how we were gonna address that. So what we had, we had a campaign called Lucha, which was called Land Use and Community Action. Uh, then we look at transportation issues. Uh, we had the issues where we looked at, uh, for instance, the Oak Springs, uh, uh, park, and then we looked also to at the Roy Guerrero Colorado River Park, and then we have the Young Scholars for Justice and the Nawiolin Healthy Communities, which gives educational classes to young parents of elementary school students, uh, looking at uh, water, air, uh, the earth, uh, energy, uh, those particular issues. And so most of us, our goal is how do we protect the health and the well-being of our communities and how do we make sure that we are at the table and participating uh, in any issues that impact uh, the low income and communities of color, and specifically in East Austin. Yeah, so um, here at the tank farm, it was a 52-acre tank farm site where we had six of the largest uh, oil companies uh, that were storing the petroleum byproducts here. So you had uh, Citco, Gulf Coastal State, Mobile, Texaco, uh, and Chevron uh, were all here on this 52 acres. But one of the big issues is when they received their permit, and when they looked at their emission rates, it was looked at as if it was only one corporation here, when in essence you had six corporations here all together. So they were not looking at the cumulative emissions uh, on the 52 acre site. And that was a big issue because as a state was just uh, permitting as if they were the only a facility in the area when in essence there were six. And so when we looked at the whole issue of the benzene emission, we saw that benzene was being admitted in this area 720 times over the allowable rate. And that was a big issue because for people who don't know, benzene is a known carcinogen, is known to cause cancer. And so when you look at um, all the different um, byproducts that the petroleum companies used and then you also looked at the major spills that they were having here in this area and also t a lot of the time their vapor recovery system was down and so their emissions were going out into the community full-blown uh, and the community was not really aware of just how much exposure was happening even though they were feeling the health impacts uh, of the exposure of living next door or around the corner uh, to um, this tank farm. Yeah, so what happened was on December the 18th, um, uh, Dr. Silvia Herrera, uh, and I'll let you know that we're on our Christmas break, couple that always uh, closes down uh, like the 16th or the 18th of December. We follow the school calendar and we don't open back till January the 4th or the 5th. Uh, so Dr. Heredia was looking through the classifieds and she saw that Mobile was wanting to expand uh, the tank farm and so it was seeking a permit. Uh, so she gave me a call and she says, look, this is what's happening. And I told her, hey, we're on Christmas break. <laughs> and she says, it don't matter, we got to go do the research. So we headed to the Texas Control uh, 
the Texas Air Control Board. At that time, TCEQ was not together. There were separate entities. And we began to look at the research. And we also saw in that research that the health department had written a letter saying, we're really concerned about expanding the mobile facility because of all the emissions and because you have residents living surrounding the area. And so that was uh, sort of like a lot of the things we were researching, of course, the, the, all the different products of the storage tank facilities. Uh, then we began to look at, okay, this is some really terrible things that are happening in this community. And so from doing the research and finding, and at the beginning of January, we had our community meeting and we began to say, here are, here are the chemicals that are being admitted in this area and here are the side effects of this particular exposure. Uh, from then we went on to develop a health survey looking at if you're exposed to certain chemicals, what are you know, the impacts of these chemicals? Uh, and with that, we were able to uh, go out into the community and find out. We found some really basic stuff. Uh, one of the things we found out was just about everybody, everyone's household had these big bottle of aspirins. Uh, and it seems like just about everyone was experiencing headaches in this particular uh, area. We also found a lot of the children who were having nosebleeds for no apparent reason and rashes. And what was happening was the doctors were misdiagnosing and saying they were uh, scabies. And so people were having to really clean out their house and do their linens and all this, but it wasn't. It was because the reaction uh, that the children were having and the nosebleeds were like when you put those canaries in the minefield and you see what happens. And so what we felt like the times of Baker, the vapor recovery system wasn't working, the kids really were the ones who felt the most impact and then they would just have these nosebleeds and the rashes, right? And so when we looked at all the health issues and we found a lot of cancers in this particular area too, uh, which was not normal also uh, in talking to their residents. And so that began the process of having weekly meetings uh, with the residents to find out just how they were being impacted, what they had experienced and so forth. And then what happened after that whole organizing in January um, February the 10th, we put together the first toxic tour. And so in that toxic tour, we got uh, Councilman Garcia was able to get a Capitol Metro bus for us. And at the Oak Springs Library, we loaded up the elected officials, uh, some of the, pr the principals from the school, some of the community leaders. Uh, and we actually came out here to the tank farm. Uh, one of the first uh, houses we stopped at was Miss Padilla's house on Al. And she talked about how uh, her children and her family were, you know, feeling these impacts, you know, dizziness, headaches, rashes. But when they left and go out to visit their families, you know, like in Lockhart or Bastrop, they felt just well. And then they'd come back and they'd really feel again the impact. We also went to. Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Betty's house that Betty Allen who lived uh, over here and she would work in her garden and she would break out in all these blisters and she showed us and then we stopped at Nancy Flores house because that's where there were berms here and the access would go into the community and the children would play in that water uh, and you could see the sheen so it had petroleum byproducts by in it and the, the children again were getting all these uh, sores and stuff because not realizing that that water was uh, contaminated. So that toxic tour uh, and having that toxic tour was one of the best things we ever did because we had State Representative Gonzalo Barrientos with us and State Representative Glenn Maxey. And they then, uh, they then uh, uh, advised the Air Control Board to come out and do the testing and then they asked the Water Commission to come out and do uh, the testing on the runoff that was happening in the communities. Uh, and so, and the other thing was that all the people that were on the tour, they got to come out here. And, and the thing that I, I reference people to that if you ever go fill up your car with gasoline and you get that whiff, and then you kind of have to navigate turns so you don't smell the gasoline, well, that's what it smelled like out here. So 
when you stepped out into this community, you smelled like you were just pumping gasoline out here, which was horrible for somebody coming in to see this and to smell it. Like these people were living here 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year, living with uh, that odor and, and those uh, emissions that were happening here. So that toxic tour really lift a lot of things. Uh, and we also invited, of course, the media. So of course the media was, was documenting all of this, taking pictures and they followed up on the, the water testing and, and the air testing uh, in the community. Um, and I don't know if you want me to go on and tell the next thing or you have a specific no, question. No, 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 <laughs> Be because because uh, since we had the toxic tour and all of these particular issues, our next step was, you know, how do we address um, the uh, different agencies and elected officials? Well, one of the things we did is that we wrote to the agencies of toxic disease and registry, the federal one, and say, look, this is happening here in East Austin. You need to come and check it out. What they did was then they called the Texas Health Department and said, look, we've got this complaint. You need to go check it out to, to see what's happening in that community. Uh, and so we also went to the Austin City Council and we took uh, community people there to talk about the issue here. Pretty much it fell, it fell on deaf ears with the City Council. They really didn't listen to us. And then what happened is we went to the county commissioners and it was Judge Bill Alshire and um, County Commissioner Marcus De Leon that appropriated $350,000 to do a civil and criminal investigation uh, on the tank farm. And, and that was, I think, um, sort of like the really boost that we needed to really uh, be able to say there's a big issue and the problem that is happening here. At the same time, the Austin American Statesman decided that it would also do a health uh, survey out in the community. So they hired people also to be door knocking and talking about uh, what people were experiencing here. Uh, and, and I have to tell you that organizing was happening weekly, weekly on this particular uh, issue. Uh, but it was when the county commissioners hired the biologists and scientists to come out and do the testing. And um, they said we could uh, have two community people be with that team of biologists and, and scientists along with District Attorney Ken Oden at that time. And um, the, who was selected was Ron Davis, who was the president of the East Austin Strategy Team, uh, and myself uh, with Poder. And so we were the two, uh, two people designated to be part of that investigative team. And uh, we c actually came on site and, you know, the biologists were taking samples and all of these particular things were, were happening out here uh, on the tank farm. When we got to Gulf Coastal States, um, they stopped us and they said we could not go in and um, and attorney Ken Oden said, well, look, we have this to go out and do the expansion. And then he said, OK, you all could go in. But those two people, which was Ron Davis and myself, he said, we're not allowed to go in uh, with the team. And at that point, you know, I pretty much said, well, go ahead. You, you all go in. You know, you're the scientists and, 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 uh, and um, you're the ones checking this and we can just wait. And uh, I remember County Ken Oden says, we're a team. We all go in together or we don't go at all. And he said, but we need for them to physically stop us and I will file an injunction against them. Uh, and so at that time, uh, uh, Ron Davis and ourselves, and I told Ron, I told Ron Davis, uh, he, I said, I'm right behind you, Ron, <laughs> because there was this really big guy <laughs> uh, with uh, one of the, the supervisors or whatever, and he was like, I'll see if you're going to come in or not. <laughs> so I, I went behind Ron and sure enough, he stopped him. He physically stopped him. And so Ken Oden said, let's go. And uh, he went to file the papers, went to file the papers so that we could go back out there and, and do the inspection. Uh, but that was, I think, the, the other crucial area uh, was them being able to do that testing. Uh, meanwhile, the tank farm uh, people uh, were pretty much blasting us on radio and uh, media. And what they had done was they used the grassroots media 
uh, to go after us and they use like uh, KAZI to talk about these issues because they knew where people of color were like the media outlets that they were. And so what we did was we were able to organize with, with uh, NACOA and La Prensa because we really didn't want to stop them from getting that money. I mean, the money that they were, could receive from these corporations could sustain their paper for the whole year because they're not, you know, big papers. But what we asked them is say whenever they're going to put an ad, allow us to do an editorial. Uh, and that's how we worked it out so we could always tell the community side of the story about what was really happening. Uh, they then uh, also had meetings at like at Johnston High School uh, where they had some epidemiologists come on and basically it was pretty uh, embarrassing uh, the tactics that they used because uh, in that whole presentation with their epidemiologists, uh, they were saying that it was not the tank farm or the emission. It was because we drank, we ate too much chili, you know, we ate all this fat, fat food, that it was basically what was impacting our health was our whole diet. Uh, and so, and, and to, add, to add to insult, they were saying, well, there's a chain link fence around the property. So the contamination is contained within the fence. And we just thought like, wow, this is really like, do you really talk down to people that a chain link fence is gonna contain the contamination? So um, the corporations and their representatives were horrible to the community and really looked down on the community like they were not knowledgeable about anything that was really uh, happening out here. Um, there was a mass organizing, mass organizing happening uh, out here. The tank farm uh, not only gained local um, media coverage, it got national and then international coverage also. We had CBS and NBC and Univision came down here. And then we had our own uh, people who put together uh, the video for us, which was um, Renee Renteria and uh, Joseph Fitton from St. Edwards. So that video, he was out able to put it out on the New York satellite dish and get it out to so many people got to see what was happening here in East Austin, Texas. Uh, and the other thing we have to remember is that we were sort of at the beginning phase of the environmental justice, environmental racism movement that was happening uh, nationwide with um, low-income and people of color communities being the frontline communities being exposed to all these particular emissions. And so it was like at the right time to really be exposing what was happening here uh, at the tank farm and in particular here in, in East Austin. Yeah. So, uh, when, like I said, when we were working on the tank farm issue, uh, and especially when we went to city council, a lot of the mainstream groups uh, came to us and began to say, well, how can we help? And we said, we do, we need the help because East Austin can't do it on itself. A lot of the elected officials, you all know them personally, you have connections with them. So we had uh, the Sierra Club, the Audubon Society, at that time, Earth First was still around. Uh, SOS and so uh, a lot of the people came to say how can how can we help in this particular issue and our whole thing is that we need you to help in writing the letters uh, I don't think email was in already but not as much as it is today uh, but we need to do write the letters we need to make the calls uh, we need for you all to support us in this particular uh, issue and what's happening uh, one good thing out of it was that when we got all the air control data of the emissions and we saw all these numbers, it was very foreign to us and we're going like, what does this mean really? And so Dr. Neil Carmen with the Sierra Club, he stepped up and he says, I'm an air specialist and I want to work with Poded to break this down to the community level so that people would understand what all these figures meant, you know, and then to take it even further because he could counter uh, the air control board with what he saw in his findings. Uh, and so that was a real blessing to us to have Dr. Neil Carmen really, you know, play that major role 
uh, in looking at all the particular air missions and, and what was happening. And then to, to have the support of the other community groups uh, come forward. But I do want to say that one of the first things we had to do in working with um, mainstream environmental group was that we didn't want them to speak for us that the whole model at that time was we speak for ourselves and that we wanted to make sure that the community people were the spokespersons and not uh, the mainstream groups and so we had to really come on an understanding of how you know how to work in that uh, process uh, because you uh, the community was always go like, well, if white people come in, they know more, let them take over and they'll sit down and not do anything. And we said, we've already gone through that. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure that the community's at the table, that we have our own spokespersons and that we're following this issue because if something goes wrong, they're going to say, oh, well, you let them take over the issue and they lost it for us. But this way it says, no, you're also responsible. But at the same time, you're showing your children and your families that you care about the health and welfare of your family and other families. And you're setting a very good model. And hey, my grandmother was there, my aunt was there, my great grandma, you know, everybody is taking that stand. And that was the, the other thing is that it was like 90% women involved in this particular issue and about 10% male. So women were really out there because they were the ones that were having to, you know, tend to their children being sick, to the family members, those that have cancer. What people don't realize is not just a person that has cancer that's affected, but the entire family and the community is impacted when, when they have cancer. And so their involvement was real high. They selected Fidelina, Fidelina Rivera, which was one of the elders as a Spanish spokesperson. Uh, she spoke absolutely no English, and we had a big uh, amount of people here that were Spanish speakers. Actually, she went to the uh, Texas Air Control Board to testify, uh, and she testified in Spanish. And so, um, also we told people, you need to have interpreters there, and you need to pay, because they were saying, well, can somebody from Poder come? And we're going like, yeah, we could, but we also know that you pay uh, for translation. So you should have people already translating instead of when we went to city council, they were having Councilman Gus Garcia translate, you know, and so we're going like, no, that's not how it works. You're supposed to hire translators. Um, and I think the other issue that I want to really talk about was that uh, we put together the Citizens uh, Monitoring Committee and uh, Glenn Maxey helped push that through at the state level of establishing that. Uh, and so what we did was we got 15 people on that citizens, uh, Tank Farm Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, they were leaders and representatives. Uh, and what we did was we said, no, we're not gonna be going to the Texas Air Control Board, which was way over there on I-35. Uh, and there was actually no bus access even to get to that particular site. So we said, no, we want the meetings in the community and the way we established that Tank Farm Citizen Monitor Committee is that the committee was at the table and the state and city and county was in the audience and they would have to come up and then answer the questions of the community. So we flipped the table on who's really in control and who really does the agenda and who asks the questions. And we would, you know, ahead of the week and say, okay, you need to come and talk and don't come over here and says, well, I'm missing that person. We don't have the health person or we don't have the air person. Bring everybody that you know that we're going to need to answer these specific questions uh, there. And that was a very a powerful organizing tool in flipping the usual model of, you know, you come to us and we control the agenda versus the community controls the agenda and you, you are accountable and responsible to the community. Uh, and that's why I said there was massive organizing uh, happening in, in, the, in the tank farm area. And it took a lot of people working together uh, to address this issue uh, that was happening. But I think what a lot of people were surprised uh, about was that, uh, that we were so successful 
that in a whole year, in that following year, the tank farm closed. We came to an agreement uh, because of all the information that the scientists and biologists found, uh, Ken Oden was able to use that leverage to sign an agreement to relocate uh, their facility. Uh, and when we started that negotiations, really they wanted 10 years to relocate. And um, we worked it down to three years because we knew they would have to find another site, they would have to get their permits, but we said 10 years is too long. We would agree with three years of them doing it. And so um, one by one, they began to sign the agreement to relocate. The last holdout, the last holdout was Exxon. Exxon did not want to sign the agreement. Uh, and if you remember, if people recall, uh, the Ex uh, Exxon Verdez had just happened major oil spills uh, in our ocean and contamination. So the world was pretty much looking at this whole big catastrophe that was happening. And so Exxon wasn't really on a good foot to be fighting, not signing the agreement. But what happened was at that time, we didn't have Facebook and all this other stuff. So we were making calls and sending faxes. So we were sending faxes to our uh, allies in Houston because we were going to go protest at Exxon's headquarters in Houston. And so, and not only that, we were mobilizing throughout the United States and people, different networks were sending letters to Exxon, you need to close, blah, blah. So there was massive organizing happening. Uh, we were scheduled to go to Houston. I don't know if it was like February the 17th or the 18th. Uh, we had organized, we had the calls, we had the people together. Well, the day before we were leaving to go to Houston, we got the call that Exxon had agreed uh, to sign the agreement. Uh, so the protest was off. And I tell you, that was more work than anything. Because <laughs> then we had to call everybody and fax everyone and tell them that agreement had been reached and that we were having a press conference here in front of the tank farm to announce that. Uh, versus going to uh, Houston. Uh, but it was such a beautiful victory, such a beautiful, beautiful victory that happened in such a, a short period of time. Uh, but it took uh, mass organizing to do it. It talked about raising the consciousness of people, about addressing humanity, about how, you know, our children and families were being exposed. Um, but it, it, it all came you know, getting all of them to agree to, to relocate. And of course, uh, what happened afterwards was then uh, looking at the zoning issue. We knew that zoning was the bottom line. When we were organizing, we said, okay, what is it that has allowed 90% of all the industrial zoning to be, the industrial facilities to be in, in East Austin? And it was zoning. Zoning had allowed, you know, toxic corporations to be adjacent to homes and schools. And so we knew that our next step was embarking on changing a lot of the zoning in our communities and changing the zoning here at the tank farm so that we would never ever have any polluting facility be able to build here on, on the 52 acre uh, tank farm site. Uh, the other thing that happened was that the uh, tax appraisal TCAT had, um, had reduced the values in these homes by 50%. So because only uh, the perception of all the contamination, they had devalued the properties for over by 50% here in this particular area. And of course, then we had to work on that particular issue because what happened was then um, the lawyers came in and decided they would do a court case uh, to represent the communities uh, with, about the, uh, the impact and the toxic emissions from the corporations. And so that was another uh, kind of organizing tool that had to happen. Um, and lawyers ascended on this community. And we had to do workshops on you know, who do you hire? You don't hire a divorce lawyer. You know, do they go to district court? Is this, a, you know, is this a civil case? Is this a criminal case? And so it was doing a lot of, again, education on this particular area. But one of the things we wanted to do was do bring everybody together and do a class action suit. 
Uh, unfortunately, six different attorneys came in uh, to represent, and there was only one attorney that was willing to look at the health impact. The rest was on trespass of property, you know, that was what they were suing for. Uh, at the end, the uh, judge made them all come together. It wasn't class, but they made them all work together. And that case took over about three years or so, back and forth, you know, what they were going to do, if they were going to settle, if they weren't. And they were wearing the people down uh, on this whole suit. And again, that was organizing to make sure everybody, you know, signed on to the suit and knew about the suit and what was happening. Um, and so that was part of it. And then the last part was monitoring the cleanup. Monitoring the cleanup here at the tank farm took 15 years. 15 years we had to monitor the cleanup. They drilled deep water well, uh, deep wells to uh, look at the petroleum byproducts. Uh, the other thing was that the state left it up to each corporation to decide if they wanted to clean up to industrial standards or to a single family uh, stand zoning. And we were trying to get the city to rezone everything single family so they would clean up to, to single family uh, uh, you know, standards, but that didn't happen. And so there was only one company, which was the Gulf Coastal States, uh, that cleaned up to uh, residential standards. Everybody else cleaned up to industrial standards, which meant you could legally leave contamination on site but you could never build housing uh, on these particular uh, sites. Uh, and so that the story of the, the tank farm and the exposure and the massive education information and organizing that took here was tremendous. When we went to court, I remember oh, there were the attorneys were trying to get a change of venue and they were trying to get the case moved to Houston, which is a petroleum-based state, right, uh, city. And um, they produced a, a book of articles and said that in one year, 365 articles had come out regarding the tank farm in one year. And that was their argument for moving it to Houston because they didn't feel they could get a fair trial here in Austin because basically it was almost like every day an article was written, even though maybe some were written like one weekend, five or six articles, but really they produced uh, a whole book of 365 articles regarding uh, the tank farm. So that's just to let people know how much exposure um, the struggle uh, to close the tank farm um, was at. Uh, here in Austin and of course that writing wasn't just Austin it was also the state level and, and national level where articles were coming out uh, about the tank farm. <laughs> it was basically December of 91 was learning about the permit in February the 18 was the signing of the agreement in 1994 they were all gone. In one year, they had actually closed or consolidated with other places that they had in one year, which was really just, you know, tremendous uh, and unbelievable that all of this happened in such a short frame of time. Yeah, I think one of the greatest challenges was resources. We had gotten a small grant from uh, Lois Gibbs uh, a Hazardous Waste uh, um, Foundation and they had given us $2,000. So we took on billion dollar corporations with $2,000. And at each meeting we would pass a hat and pick up nickels and dimes and quarters and dollars. And most of that was for us to be able to make flyers, to put out the information, uh, information that we needed. Uh, nobody was on salary, everybody was volunteer, uh, and so uh, I always look at that resource issue. Uh, we were very blessed to be able to have, you know, students that were journalists that would do the video, uh, to have people on co-op talking about the story, be able to uh, get into a lot of the media for free. 
Uh, but it was really hard not having a, a lot of resources because, of course, you were fighting billion dollar corporations and transnational corporations that had so much money. Uh, and so I think that that was one of the barriers. The other one was the bureaucracy. Uh, the fact that the Texas Air Control Board wasn't talking to the Water Control Board, so there wasn't this communications and permitting, like what do you see there, what, are, what were the fines that were happening there. The fact that we had to go way across town where there was no bus access to go to the public hearings, uh, you know, on the permit, um, to make sure we had standing. Uh, those were all particular barriers that uh, we had to uh, overcome and encounter, uh, having to, you know, take people to city council and having to wait with children and family and have your agenda moved to the late in the evening, knowing you had all these families that, that you would brought and, you know, we had to rent, you know, vans and get people other to give rides. We had to then get food to make sure we had food and sandwiches and drinks for the children and stuff like that. So all of those things that we had to encounter in trying to, you know, organize and clean up this particular uh, tank farm area. And like I say, going from the federal to the state to the la local health department, uh, all of these things uh, took a lot of time. Uh, and especially for those that had their jobs and were doing this when they could do it or there were students and helping when they could uh, do it. But I think that the biggest bureaucracy was, uh, you know, the corporations and the agencies themselves who are not used to listening to the grassroots communities about uh, their concerns and their health concerns. There was the biggest victory was in organizing because not only were we able to talk to everybody, but we actually formed neighborhood associations. What came out of the tank farm was the Alpha Neighborhood Association, the Stewart Circle Neighborhood Association, the Comer Cole Neighborhood Association. And so um, then we had the gardens already existed. We put together the tank, uh, tank, uh, tank farm a neighborhood association. So it was like really teaching people how the bureaucracy worked and how they had to organize their neighborhoods and register their neighborhoods. Uh, and so to me, that was a big victory in the communications. But the biggest, I mean, there's no doubt the biggest victory that brought tears to our eyes that we all cried about was closing the tank farm. That was, that was the biggest victory uh, that we could ever experience in our lives was being able to protect the health of our elders, our children, the family, the upcoming generations. I mean, to us, it was such a sweet victory to have that. Um, and so, I mean, that, that was the blessing of all of this work and organizing was uh, closing down the toxic tank farm. I think that what we should remember is the legacy of racism that this city has had for such a long time that, you know, in their 1928 master plan uh, to relocate people of color east of the highway, but not only that, to all the unwanted facilities would also be in people of color. I think that we can never forget that racist history uh, that this, this city was founded on and how we have to continue to correct that racism and that whole structure of racism that continues to, you know, let people of color and low income people be exposed to such chemicals uh, now. Uh, to me, that's a real important um, piece. Uh, and to always be looking at the, the issue of zoning, you know, as we look today, is in, it's not maybe contaminating, contamination and pollution, but it's now gentrification and displacement. And again, that's all about land use and zoning. And so I think that we really need to always be looking at when we talk about zoning and changing categories and uh, how does that gonna impact the most vulnerable population? How does that impact the poor and the working poor? And I think that that's part of our humanity. If we're not looking at the most vulnerable population and how that population 
got to be the most vulnerable population. I think we're doing a disservice to humanity by not looking at those particular issues. Absolutely, and I think when we look at planning for the future, again, it has to be uh, looking at land use, you know, and zoning, uh, but looking at how do we make sure uh, that we are creating a city that welcomes everyone, regardless, you know, of the color of their skin, their language, their income. And so in the future, we have to make sure that when we do development, that when we talk about diversity, that we're not just talking about ethnicity, we're also talking about diversity of income. And so how do we make sure that we don't isolate, you know, people of color, uh, our low income, you know, when we're talking about um, where are we building and how we're integrating people. I think for the future, and, and I'm really happy to see that uh, this younger generation is really looking past this whole issue of correcting racism and you know now there's classes on undoing racism and and i see the supportive role that the younger generation is doing in that it's all right if you speak a, another language uh, it's all right if you have another um, philosophy or religious belief is the acceptance and so i see i see that generation and i see it you know within my grandkids you know, how they've really opened up. And then young students that I work with from UT and St. Edward and Southwestern about how they now look at, they don't want to be in that racist structure anymore. They want to change, like I say, the diversity, not just in ethnicity, but income. And how can we all live together, you know? And how, how make sure that we're inclusive and not exclusive. And to me, I see that as, as moving forward on, uh, on making the society and the world a better place. Uh, and definitely uh, looking at the environment and looking at the environment, not from this perspective that a lot of the mainstreams used to be, that the environment was just nature kind, but looking at, at the environment as nature kind and humankind interwoven into log and inseparable. And I say, that's, I see that new concept that a lot of the uh, younger generation are looking like, yeah, the environment is just not nature. It's not just about the spotted uh, owl or the whale. It's about people. It's about fence line communities. And I think that's how we've been able to make a lot of the changes is because that next generation is really open. You know, they've seen a lot and they don't really like it, you know, and they want a lot of changes. And to me, that's the future generation. And, and that's the hope, you know, that's, that's the, the spirit that keeps me going, you know, that I'm able to wake up the next day and here's the next issue and it's okay, you know, because I love working with the younger generation because I, 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 to me that's the thing is that um, the elders and the youth have to work together. We have a lot to offer to them, but they have a lot to offer to us too. And so that's where I see the next step really going on. Uh, and I see a lot of that advocacy, like in housing, people like, no, we got to build not just what you call affordable, but also low income uh, housing and all of these different issues, immigration, everything. So I, I, I see a whole different perspective. And so I see in the future a, a lot of more uh, integration and inclusion in our society than than it's been happening in the past and, and also just recently. No, I, I, think, I think that the only thing that I might add was that, uh, is that when we looked at the tank farm and the petroleum corporations of how we need to look at getting away from fossil fuels and that this gives us the real opportunity even at that time we were talking what's the alternatives you know what's the alternatives of getting away from uh, the fossil fuels and i think that that's why uh, a lot of the mainstream groups also came aboard because they understood that you know uh, the impact in the environment with the, the petroleum industries and the fossil fuels uh, even though for to us it was more like i said it was 
uh, the environment, but also the impact on, on humanity that was happening here. So I think that um, that gives us a lot of, a lot of uh, work it also opens a lot of doors for us working and collaborating together uh, uh, because even if you might look at it just from an environmental perspective, uh, you have to look at it from um, a human perspective and look at uh, the fence line communities because that's what it is. Those communities right there were the fence line communities that were adjacent to the tank farm.